We say welcome to our visitors tonight. We're glad that you're with us. You know, if you're carrying a Bible in your hand, you have it in your possession, you're carrying one of the most powerful things on the face of the earth. Not because of the material that it's made out of, but because of the message that's found therein. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, the Hebrews writer says this, The Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints of the morrow, and the morrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's Word is living and it is is powerful that's why paul said in romans chapter 1 verse 16 and 17 that we should not be ashamed of the gospel of christ the word of god for it is the power of god unto salvation to all those who believe to the jew first and also to the greek verse 17 for therein in the gospel in the word of god the righteousness of god is revealed from faith to faith just as it is written the just shall live by faith. God's word is powerful. It can transform lives. It can transform the destiny of nations. It is the only power on earth to save a human soul. I want us to consider this evening this scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. As we consider the power of God's word, and as we consider the all-sufficiency of God's word. We find in this verse, as Paul is writing to Timothy, he says, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instru instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. God's powerful word is under consideration here in this passage of scripture. You notice he uses the word all. And what we're going to do tonight, we're going to break down this verse, look at some key terms and key phrases of it, and then we're going to look at the attitude of society, the religious society, towards the word of God and the reason why there is so much division, confusion, and lack of unity because of the attitudes that we will explore tonight. Notice he says the word all there in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. He, in verse 15, was talking about the Old Testament scriptures that Timothy was taught. And then he says all scripture. That refers to every bit of it. Not only the Old Testament, but the New Testament. All 66 books are referred to as scripture all scripture the word scripture is from the greek word graphe we get the word graphic from it you've ever seen or come across you might not even work with graphics it comes from that greek word graphe and it means a writing a thing that is written and it was a general word that referred to anything that was written down and so had no type of religious significance at all except when it's referring to the scriptures being the word of God. It's like we might use the word book in the general sense referring to any book, but when we refer to the book, we're referring to the word of God. So all of the sacred writings from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation are given to us by God. Given by the inspiration of God. All of it. That phrase there is from one compound Greek word. The Greek word is pronounced theonustos. And it simply means God breathed. That word is a simple word, and some translations even translate it that way. All scripture is God-breathed. 
Theo, Theo, there is Theos, the word for God, and Neustos, or Pneuma, is the word there for breath, or sometimes wind. So it is God's breath that has given us the word of God. This is referring to the fact that the scriptures are God-breathed. He spoke words, and the writers wrote it down by the power of the Holy Spirit that what was written in the scripture would be the very word of God. Not the words of men, but the words of God. So it is given by the inspiration of God, or that one Greek word there, God breathed. And we see that it is profitable. We know that the word profitable means something that's advantageous, something that helps us. Something that we have that is profitable is something that's going to aid us in doing something. Well, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So it's profitable or it aids us for doctrine. The word doctrine there simply means teaching. We talked about that this morning. How that God's word gives us the teaching. What is to be believed, what is to be taught, what is to be practiced, that is found in the scripture. So God's word or the scripture are profitable for doctrine, for reproof. The word reproof there means to prove again, reproof. We have to be reproved sometimes. We have to be put back on the right track. And we know in Jeremiah 10 and verse 23, Jeremiah says, O Lord, I know that it's not in man that walks to direct his own steps. Therefore, we have to be taught what is right and what is wrong. And that goes along with the word correction. The scripture is good for correction. Correcting us, putting us back on the right path. When we go astray, when we are incorrect, the word of God corrects us and puts us on the right path. And that is found in the sacred writings or the scripture. Also, the scripture is profitable for instruction in righteousness. Remember one of the scriptures that we gave, Romans chapter 1, verse 17, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. That is the way by which we may be made right in the sight of God. Therefore, righteousness is found in the scripture. God's writings tells us how we might be made right, how that we might live the life. We have to have that instruction in righteousness. We're made right or justified by the gospel. The book of Romans is all about justification by obedient faith. So the instruction in righteousness, again, found in the scripture, in the holy or sacred writings. That the man of God. Now Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy here is called a man of God because he is a preacher. But in the general sense, Timothy was a Christian. And every man and every woman should desire to be a person of God. That means a person belonging to God. And if we wish to be a person belonging to God, we have to look again to the scriptures. To the scripture that instructs us in how we are to be a person of God. And that's the only place that we can look for that proper instruction. That the man of God or the person of God may be complete. Now we understand what that word means. Some translations have the word perfect. That's the old English for complete. For something to be complete, it means it's finished. If you ask uh, your child, have you completed your homework? Uh, if they've done everything in their homework, it is complete. There's nothing lacking. Nothing lacking that is to be done. So for a person of God to be complete before God, they must look to the scripture, the sacred writings. The man of God or the person of God may be complete before God through the scripture. 
thoroughly equipped. When you are preparing to do something and you need equipment to do that, you gather all your equipment together so that your equipment might be available for the task. Thoroughly equipped means completely equipped. So he's emphasizing the all-sufficiency of the Scripture. That we might be complete in the Scripture and thoroughly equipped in the Scripture. Equipped for what? For every good work. So every good work that God requires us to do, everything that we know that would be pleasing in the sight of our Creator, we go to the Scripture. In that we learn the way of righteousness. We're instructed in the way of righteousness. We are corrected when we go astray. We find reproof there. We find what is proper to believe in doctrine. That we might be complete and thoroughly equipped, equipped with everything that we need for every good work. Now as we read this and we see this, we see that this verse is basically saying this. The Word of God, the, the Old New and New Testament, complete, gives us everything we need. We don't need anything else. It is the all-sufficient Word of God. All the, you know, all the information that I need to know and all the strength and all the empowerment that I need from God to live the Christian life is in the writings, in the Scripture. And that was completed 2,000 years ago. And God makes it very clear. You do not add to. You do not take away from it. Therefore, what we have is an all-sufficient God. Now, when people have that mindset, and you're studying with them, and, and, and they are looking to be guided by God, they're going to say, Lord, what would you have me to do? And we point them to the scriptures. Here's the answer. Here is the answer for what you must do to be saved, to live the Christian life, to live before God in righteousness. It's all here. And so that brings us to the second part of our lesson tonight. Uh, before we get into it, I want you for a homework assignment to read Psalm 119. It is the longest chapter in the Bible. Longest chapter. And it praises the majesty and the power of God's Word. You will see it over and over again as Psalm 119 is rejoicing in the power of God's Word. We've, we've looked at the Bible. The Bible is the all-sufficient guide to heaven. This is everything we need. This is our roadmap. This is our blueprint. This is our recipe. This is our pattern to get to heaven. But the problem in our society is this problem. Those who claim to believe in God and those who claim to believe the Bible is the Word of God, and I'm not talking about those who don't really believe the Word of God. They kind of sort of pick and choose. I'm talking about people in the religious world who actually believe that the Bible is the Word of God. They have this attitude, the Bible plus. The Bible plus. What we're going to see, this attitude is incompatible with 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And as long as people have the attitude, the Bible plus, we will have confusion, we will have division, we will have denominationalism, we will not have true Christianity in the world at large. The Bible plus, what do you find? People say, yes, the Bible plus creeds, confessions, and catechisms. That's what you find in the religious world. The word creed comes from the Latin word credo, and it simply means I believe. It's a statement of faith. However, the creed that we have is the Bible itself. You know, one preacher said it wisely. He said, if a creed contains more than the Bible, it contains too much. If it contains less than the Bible, it contains too little. 
And if it contains the same as the Bible, we don't need it. We already have the Bible. So you have the creeds of the churches written, some of them hundreds of years ago, and that's what people hold to. You go to a certain denominational website, they'll give their creed. They'll, they'll give you a web page that you can go to and it'll list their creed. We believe this, 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 and this. Also, the same thing you find in a confession and also in a catechism. You find catechisms, uh, especially in the Catholic Church, in which they put forth their doctrine. And they say, therefore, uh, yes, the Bible, but also the Bible plus these things. And each one is different, and each one is unnecessary. We've already seen from our scripture that if 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17 is true, then we don't need these creeds, confessions, or catechisms. Also, you have this. The Bible plus a mission statement. It's kind of an informal creed or an informal uh, statement of faith, confession. But you find this in uh, religious groups that they'll have the Bible plus this is our mission statement. This is our purpose. This is what we're trying to do. And this is what you must uh, give your allegiance to if you're going to be a part of that group. But again, it's that attitude of the Bible, yes, plus this, plus the mission statement. And usually the mission statement or the creed will say, yeah, we believe the Bible and it's all sufficient. Well, then you don't need the mission statement. You don't need the creed. The Bible is all that we need, as we have seen from the scripture that we've explored tonight. So the concept of a mission statement is something that is not needed at all. Here you also find this in the church manual. Some Baptist groups have a church manual. Also other denominations do as well. That has within it their uh, organization of their particular denomination, how it is set forth, the laws and the bylaws of that particular group, and how to carry out certain things. It's an instruction manual. But again, we already have an instruction manual. The all-sufficient Word of God. Therefore, as long as this attitude exists, the Bible plus this, there will be division. Because one church manual will differ from another church manual. One is unique to that den denomination, and another is unique to another denomination. Again, this is something that is unnecessary if 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 is true. We also have this, the Book of Mormon. You may have seen the commercials where they're talking and uh, uh, someone will say, did you know there is another testament of Jesus Christ? This is from the LDS Church, the Church of Latter-day Saints, also known as the Mormon Church. I have an old copy of the Book of Mormon, but you can order from the 1-800 number that they give, and they'll send you one free. And what this is, is a book that was supposedly translated by Joseph Smith in the early 1800s, in which he claims the angel Moroni appeared to him and told him about some golden plates that was in upstate New York. He went and he found the golden plates and translated them into the Book of Mormon, which is supposed to be a testimony of the work of Christ over here in the Americas and the church over here in the Americas. They claim that the American Indians, the Native Americans, are the descendants of the ten tribes, the ten lost tribes, they say, of Israel. Archaeology does not agree with that. Uh, genetics doesn't agree with that. Recently they have done some genetic testing on the Native Americans and shown there is no connection with Jewish people in any shape, form, or fashion. Uh, history does not bear this out. But they'll uh, present this as another testament of Jesus Christ. Plus they have the Pearl of Great Price, the Doctrine of Covenants, and other scriptures that they have. But this is the first one they want to introduce you to. And he put it together with books, chapters, and verses. And it, and it sounds, you know, very scriptural-like with uh, books like First and Second Nephi, uh, 
other books with chapters all in them. And it's, it sounds like scripture. But again, it's the attitude of the Bible plus. If what we studied tonight in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17 is true, then this is false. There's no way they can both be true. And when you do a study of the Book of Mormon, it contradicts itself. There are grammatical mistakes in it because it was translated into English and there are several grammatical mistakes in it. It has had to be updated year by year to try to fix some of the mistakes. It contradicts the Bible. You know, it says in here that Jesus was born in Jerusalem. When any casual studier of the Bible knows Jesus was not born in Jerusalem. He was born in Bethlehem. But that's the claim in the Book of Mormon that Jesus was born in the city of Jerusalem. So it is clearly a false scripture written by a false prophet, Joseph Smith. Its headquarters is in Salt Lake City, Utah. The major group, there are other splinter groups, and you've probably heard of the polygamist offshoots that uh, Texas and other places are having problems with. They all hold to that book because Joseph Smith was a polygamist. I don't know how many wives he had. I think he had 25 plus wives. You know, it's very interesting that these cults that get started, the founder of the cult always gets the privilege of having multiple wives. That should be a red flag to anyone who knows anything about the Bible, that something's wrong there. But again, much can be said about Mormon doctrine, but again, it's that attitude of the Bible plus the Book of Mormon. I've asked the Mormon missionaries, the 20-year-old elders that come to your door, trying to give you the Book of Mormon. I asked them, can I just follow this and go to heaven? Just follow the Bible and go to heaven? And they said, yes. Then why are they knocking the doors? Why take so much time and effort? The reason is they're striving to become gods. We'll get to go to heaven, according to Mormon doctrine, and kind of be in the basement of heaven if we just follow the Bible. And in Mormonism, if they remain faithful to that teaching, they believe that they will be exalted to godhood. Again, much can be said about that false system. The Bible plus Pentecostal revelations. The Pentecostal movement got started in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Where people from various denominations were claiming that they were receiving revelations from God. They were claiming they were speaking in tongues. And therefore the Pentecostal churches were born. And they claim that they are receiving revelations. They don't do what the Mormons do and write it down and put it in a book. But they say and they claim to get revelations from God. And you can see them on television. Robert Tilton, Jimmy Swagger, others like them who claim that God spoke to them. God gave them a dream. God appeared to them. But if what we study tonight is true, all of that is false. Because everything that we need to guide us, to direct us, to lead us, is in the sacred writings or the scripture. This is a problem that you find throughout almost all denominations and in some members of the Lord's church. The Bible plus a direct, a direct guidance from the Holy Spirit. They believe that yes, the, the Holy Spirit guides us from the, the message of the Scripture. However, there's something in addition to it. Since we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when we're baptized, Acts 2 and verse 38, they say the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Therefore, He must be guiding us on the inside. Therefore, they think that He is guiding them through their intuition, through their feelings, uh, through uh, emotions. It is just one step away from Pentecostalism. And in some areas, it's almost exactly the same. If I give someone directions to my house, and I write those directions down, and I say at the end of the directions, 
What I've written down is all sufficient. You don't need to add to it or take away from it. It will get you to my house. And I give those instructions to an individual. And then I have to call them later on and give them an additional instructions that I've contradicted myself. God the Holy Spirit said in the passage that we looked at tonight, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, everything we need is right here in the Bible. But there's something else. If that is true, then the passage is false. Yes, we're guided. Yes, we're led. Yes, we are instructed by the Holy Spirit, and this is how it's done. In the all-sufficient Scripture, not the Scripture plus direct guidance from the Holy Spirit. Brethren, this is all we need. This is all that is needed. This is all that is sufficient for us. This is the only thing that will get us to heaven. Let us not get sidetracked. Let us not be diverted. And that's what the devil wants to do. Divert us. Sidetrack us. Distract us. By these supposed leadings of the Holy Spirit. By these, these uh, made up dreams and visions that people claim. They want to get people away from, Satan does, the scripture. Because he knows the power of it. He knows that it will transform lives. God's word is powerful. Perhaps tonight you need to obey this word. Submit yourself to it. If you believe in Jesus Christ with all your heart, you're willing to confess He's the Son of God, willing to repent of all your sins. The scripture says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16 and verse 16. Why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22 and verse 16. If you've done that and you've turned away from the sacred writings, you've turned away in sin, repent, come back to the Lord. As always, the choice is yours. Always stand and sing.